because it knows that its owner cares and is listening. So it's just a matter of time before this horse is going to put her in the hospital. He may be able to fix it right now, but I'm the one that ends up getting these horses long term. And I end up fixing it for good. shouldn't have to tap that horse. It should be at a point where that horse self-loads. Look at that horse's eye. Look how Look, busy feet's a busy mind, I always say. The horse is nervous. Why would you get on, people? Why would you even get on? And then let's, yep, let's just yank on its mouth out of frustration, give it a little bit of pain. Yes. Okay, so she's walking off as you're trying to get off. Yeah, that's more of what she does there, correct? Mm-hmm. 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 Okay, mate, why don't you hop down, bring her over here, let me mess with her. Most people won't try to fix their horse's behavioral problems from under Saturn. I want to fix it on the ground. Okay. So, so he thinks that that, see how he's manipulating that? He's going to fix it on the ground. Oh, he's better than that. He's not going to make it dangerous by trying to ride and fix it. Oh, that's not the point. You're going to beat this horse down the whole time. Got it. That's a different horse. This is another ad. Oh, here we go. Too many ads. He's all about promoting. That's all this is. Money. I had a farrier, and I don't know, this is gossip, but it wouldn't surprise me. I had a farrier years ago. And again, I don't want to be spreading gossip, you guys. It just wouldn't surprise me because I've heard this about other leading international clinicians um, when I was a clinician and, you know, I was behind the scenes. And so, you know, I heard through the grapevine, you know, Clinton Anderson has a, a train, he doesn't personally have a training facility in Florida, but he has a facility that he comes to at maybe one of his certified instructors. So he does frequent Florida. and. My farrier went, was called out there, this is my old farrier, a couple of years ago, about three years ago, was called out to this facility where Clinton was and he got to meet Clinton and he got to trim some of Clinton Anderson's horses, so he says, and none of them would stand quietly, which blows my mind, but I mean, I would, those horses are beaten down so much, I can't imagine them not standing quietly. But they wouldn't stand quietly. Uh, they were nervous. And when Clinton was around, which I, you know, I'm not sure this is true, uh, my, my farrier asked him, you know, what, and he was cocky enough to ask him this if, if it's true. But the point I'm making, he asked Clint real quick, you know, what's up with your horses? You know, they're so well trained. And Clinton made the comment, I don't train my horses, not these horses anymore. He's like, I'm too busy marketing my product and selling it. I don't have time to work with the horses. So, uh, just wouldn't surprise me. That's all I'm saying. I'm not trying to spread gossip, but I have heard so many things behind the scenes that would blow your mind. Like how these guys work with horses the night before. You think they're working with your horse for the first time. You're, you know, the, or, or you might think that they're working with that person's horse for the first time and it's all magical within that first hour when bef- you don't realize that they've already talked to the owner and they've had permission to work with that horse prior. Or what about a wild horse that comes in and how they're able to whisper it in an hour. Bull! Bull, 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 bull. Most of the time they're doing something behind the scenes that's illegal, you guys. There's so much. It's such a scam. It's really sad. That's what greed will do. That's what greed and money will do. And the horse did not know how to really speak forward back of that device. She's obviously using what? The reactive side of her brain. She's wanting to fidget and yet she gets nervous. So that's a good point he made. And he's right. The horse is using its reactive side of the brain. So let me ask you a common sense question. 
If your horse is already up and moving around and you start adding more pressure and getting that horse moving even more, don't you think you're just stimulating the adrenaline release? You're just adding to that horse's nervousness. You're just making it worse. It's going to escalate. So basically, it's the same approach as Monty Roberts. He's just going to wear and beat these horses down. He may not be beating them physically with a whip, but he's browbeating them. You know, he's, he's basically going to exhaust this horse until the horse gives up. But it's only going to give up temporarily, you guys. That's the difference. So instead of getting this horse to get more relaxed and build trust and get the horse to to start to think and exercise its left brain, which is what you should be doing, he just keeps stimulating the right brain, which is the horse's natural um, sensory processing and awareness, its self-preservation. So it's really, boy, I'm having fun with this. I mean, he's just, he's speaking to a more uneducated audience to be able to say this and get away with it. And I want to educate you to catch him on this because there's too many people out there that still train like this under the discipline, if you want to call it that, of natural horsemanship. He wants to fidget and she doesn't want to stay still. The reason why that was happening is because the horse had no respect for his owner. It's not about respect. The horse is petrified. So sometimes we train horses is you've got to go back to the source of the problem, fix that. And then when you the problem. So he's going back to the source, like I keep talking about the cause, but his rational rationality or reasoning, what he believes the source to be is the horse's level of disrespect. And that's why I don't like him because his mindset is awful. It's arrogant, he's a bully, He's all about force and abuse and control and making, and he's punitive and he talks down about his horses and his people. Mm mm mm. Well, actually, they disappeared, they'll be gone, they won't be there anymore. So, basically, what I want to do. All right, enough about that. I look forward to your comments. Again, you know, I'm bringing up all these people, I'm not trying to browbeat them. I just want to spread more awareness as well as more awareness about good, correct training from the great masters, not these guys, these up and coming natural horsemen. And I also get flooded with so many emails thanking me for the work that I do. And you know, I followed so-and-so and my horse is worse. And this is one of the so-and-sos and I'll keep exposing them. And even as I've talked about other softer, more gentler trainers, and I will continue to talk about them, um, their methods aren't that great either. They're not fixing things. They're not making it better. And it's, it's not to pick on them to try to make myself look better. It's to shine a light on all the holes and why things aren't working and how you guys need to start taking more responsibility as far as listening to your gut, trusting your gut, and doing your research. You know, I followed, as I mentioned real quick before we close here, I followed a, um, I followed the Pirelli system when I got back into horses and, there, and I could have gone anywhere because I had saved the money when I decided to quit the business that I had started, the marketing firm in DC, it was my business. And I'd saved money to start a, uh, to do a two year sabbatical to study and develop myself and develop my own approach. And I decided to go with Prelly Natural Horsemanship because it had the fastest track. You know, I could go to a three month school. I didn't want to get certified. It wasn't anything like that because I wanted to do my own method. But I really loved the natural horsemanship approach. I hadn't seen anything out there, you know, I'd read books, I had studied, um, you know, not studied, personally studied with, but I was very familiar with a lot of the other um, horsemen, you know, that we know of, like Mark Rashid and Buck Branneman, and I mean, there's, there's a ton of them in your Western Horseman magazines that I had been reading, um, my dad and I, you know, there's, a, there's people that I could have studied other horsemen. 
um, that I looked up to, but nobody had a program. And I was on a fast track. I'm like, look, I've only got a certain amount of time. You know, I'm going to pay myself for two years to survive while I study. And um, as a student again, and who has a program that, that is most akin, most like what I believe in. And so I was blown, ab blown away by Pirelli horsemanship, um, natural horsemanship, until I, I came down to Florida to study with Legend. And I almost, I almost dropped out. I decided to stick through it, but, uh, but halfway through, I was, before halfway through, but, but by halfway through, I was like, God, I gotta get out of here. Um, and that's a whole nother conversation. And the point I wanna make is, I know what I'm talking about because I've, I've traveled that road. And I've seen the adverse effects on my horses following that type of natural horsemanship. You can't, the biggest thing I took away is, is I understand following a curriculum and a training system. I have one, but when you're in a big group of 20 some people and your horse is having, is struggling and he's really challenging, you can't, you can't put a square peg in a round hole. You can't make this horse keep doing these exercises when they're not working. So we have to take the time as a teacher, which I had many confrontations with my teachers then, you have to take the time to help your student. And they weren't allowed to help us instead of leaving us out there hanging. And that's the biggest problem is, yeah, I agree with the system, I see the end result, I understand the building blocks, but what happens when we get stuck and it's too challenging and neither the horse or the owner, handler, rider is learning anymore. When you're not learning and you're stuck, something has to change. And that was the biggest grievance I had, but it was awesome that I learned that because as a teacher myself, you know, I took away, oh my gosh, I never want to leave my students hanging like that. And for my horses, I had three extremely challenging horses, uh, Legend, Sundance, and Smokey. And that system just only got me so far with them. It didn't get me very far. It only got me so far. And so I realized that a lot of us out there that, that buy or inherit horses that have all these challenges and issues you just you've got to be taught a different way you can still follow the system like my training system you can still follow it but you have to be taught to the person you have to be taught how to handle your horse when x y and z happens during that exercise like what happens when my horse doesn't all of a sudden we've done everything possible to get us to the mounting block where my horse wants to pick me up and is calm and relaxed and present. But what happens when your horse doesn't show up that way? The beauty of a training system or curriculum building blocks is you can go, okay, I need to retrace my steps because something isn't strong, something's weak or some things are weak, some pieces are weak and I need to get them stronger. And there's no way if you're picking and pulling from 10 different people, there's no way you can backtrack and diagnose. And I learned that. That's the biggest thing I learned from doing Pirelli. It wasn't their method. I hated it. It was, oh my gosh, this doesn't work for all of these challenging horses. Now, it could if you, the person, is taught the way I'm teaching you. So when I developed my training system, which I sell, and all these online courses, um, it's with that in mind. It's like, yeah, you're gonna follow these building blocks and I'm gonna have videos to help support you and show you what you do in X, Y, and Z. Because it's pretty predictable, even in the most extreme cases, because I've worked with all of them and there's patterns with everything, you guys. Horses are gonna do X, Y, and Z. Predominantly X, Y, and Z. Just like people, that's human nature, it's instinctive. So when you know horses like I do, on the level I do, you can predict there's varying degrees, and some things won't be as escalated, but you can pretty much predict that the horse is going to react or respond a certain way. So keep that in mind when you're out there selecting someone to follow, 
And most importantly, when you're out there wanting a beautiful partnership with your horse and relationship with your horse, it's not easy, you guys. No relationship is easy. It's always work, no matter who it's with. And it should be because it's about developing trust, developing a deep connection, developing a sense of intimacy definitely with that other being, whether it's your horse, your partner, your children, your best friend. It's, there's so many important factors that go into that. And it's never easy because it asks a lot of ourselves. And we're asking a lot from this beautiful, magnificent creature called the horse that can be potentially very dangerous and unpredictable if we don't learn how to start reading that and taking our time and understanding how important it is to develop ourselves and our horsemanship. Nothing worth anything in life comes easy. Nothing. I'd rather spend 10 years of heartache <laughs> and some crying and stress to develop something that eventually is, is going to um, be something really positive for this world. I don't care what it takes as long as the end result I get there. And I also get to feel it and witness it along the way. You know, you got to have some inspiration. Can't be all hard work or something's wrong there too. You know, look for balance in life. All right, thank you. May you always be one with your horse.